Well, hallelujah. Amen. He is the God of all our days. He's always there for us. Never leaves us nor forsakes us. Well, let's all stand tonight and turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 9, and we take our text from verse 15. I titled this message, Right About Wrong, or, uh, wrong Things. And uh, you know, tonight, a lot of us have been that way. Even though we thought we were doing what right, was right, the key element in that was we were leaving out Jesus Christ. And how many of you know tonight that he is the answer to everything that we are or everything that we ever will be? He is. Well, the Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me uh, to bear my name and uh, before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So this morning we talked a little bit about this. We talked about how that Saul was on the road to Damascus. And he met the master. And when he met the master, in just a few seconds, it changed his life completely. And some of you can identify with that tonight, knowing that when you met Jesus Christ, he changed you forevermore. You're not the same anymore. And you can testify to that. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you. We lift you up. We magnify you. You're worthy. You are worthy of our praise. And Father, we've come tonight to praise you, lift you up. Tonight, Holy Spirit, we give you the right to do whatever you want to in this service. And we pray tonight. We pray, Father, that uh, hearts will be changed. That Christians will be encouraged. And Lord, that we'll do the things we need to do. Thank you for what you're doing for us. But most of all, thank you for salvation. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Go tell somebody you love them tonight. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. That was good. Both songs tonight, thank you all for singing for us using your talent for the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, he always blesses those that do that. Well, this morning we got a little bit into this message, but not too far. We talked on the first point, which was when you're wrong about Jesus Christ. There's so many people tonight that are wrong about Jesus Christ and who he is. This world is full of people that are searching for something, searching for a change in their life, to fill that void in their lives. But so many of those people choose the wrong things. Saul was one of those people. Saul chose his laws. He, he chose his Jewish tradition. He chose those things that was of the world to follow. These disciples, when you think about them, they were wreaking havoc upon Saul's life. As I said this morning, Saul's thinking was this. His thinking was these disciples were spreading a vicious rumor that this unfortunate master, though executed by the Romans, had risen from the dead. That was one of the lies that he thought that they were telling. He thought that they were going around the countryside with this incredible tale, stirring up false hope among the people and even among the Romans. And with this, he called it blasphemy. He talked about these poor, misguided peasants, these disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, claimed that Jesus had risen from the dead. But in his thoughts, Jesus was just a carpenter boy. How in the world could he be the Messiah? 
How could he be the one that claimed that, that he was the Messiah? And, and, and Saul was not going to believe that or trust that because all of his teaching and all of his study had told him that this could not be true. I believe in his own mind he said, get real. Because the Old Testament tells me in the Scripture plainly that anyone that hangs on a tree was cursed by God. How could this Messiah who was cursed then, how could he be a man that could take the sins of the whole world and be the Savior of the world? This had to come from Satan and his thinking. And denying Jesus Christ as he was doing and denying him, you see what he did was neutralize the value of rightness. And a lot of people have done that tonight by denying Christ. They've neutralized what Jesus really wants to do in their life and in their heart. How Jesus wants to change them. And so in this, they neutralize the difference Jesus Christ makes in a life. I've known a lot of people in my life. I've seen a lot of people in my life. I have ministered to a lot of people in my life, and I've seen those that have truly been saved. I've seen what Christ can do to an alcoholic. I've seen what Christ can do to a prostitute. I've seen what Christ can do to a broken family, how he can change that family, bring it together again, and save that family. I've seen it. No, nothing in this world can do that. Only Jesus can. So in neutralizing this righteousness, you see the difference Jesus Christ makes. Acts 9, 3 through 9 says, And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the man which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat or drink. In Acts chapter 15, or 9, 15, and 16, it says, But the Lord said unto him, Now here's his commission. Go thy way, for he is, a cho- he is chosen unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, as he was on that road to Damascus, a light shone like the noonday. And he fell to his face. And he heard a powerful voice. How many of you know and remember when you heard that powerful voice? It's a unique voice. It's that still, small voice, but still it's a powerful voice. And he heard the voice of Jesus Christ. And he responded. And as I said this morning, within 10 seconds, Saul went from believing Jesus was dead and persecuting his disciples to having a conversation and a conversion experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he became one of the leading disciples that Jesus had. That's what Jesus can do to a life. The second thing we talked about this morning is, are you right with Jesus? Are you right about Jesus Christ? Because Saul's personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, dramatically changed him. It changed him forevermore. It changed him from being a proud Pharisee who knew what was right, he thought, to a humble seeker who didn't think he knew much of anything anymore except Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. He had a conversation with him. He was no longer a Hebrew Uh, supremist. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, he would become an apostle for the Lord Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and to the kings. He had that voice. He was no longer a Pharisee. 
He would become one of the world's most eloquent uh, speakers and writers and mouthpiece for the Lord. And he would show the grace of God to everyone that he came in contact with after his conversion. He was no longer a religionist. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, he wasn't now trying to earn his salvation. We cannot earn our salvation because it's done. Nothing else has to be done. It's done. You don't add anything to salvation. You don't add salvation plus works. You don't add salvation plus baptism. You don't add salvation plus all these other things that these uh, cults have come up with. If it's not Jesus Christ, then it's not salvation. The third thing is when your conscience is convicting you. Now we know that this was happening with Saul because Acts chapter 8 verses 1 through 3 tells us this. Stay with me now. And Saul was consenting, consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committing them to prison. In Acts 9, 1 and 2, it says this, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Acts 26, 10, 11 says this, Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even into the stra unto strange cities. What a man. But when you look at this, I want you to ask yourself, as I read these scriptures, what was uh, Saul's strongest emotion at this time? What was his strongest emotion? I believe uh, he said, not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them and said, yes, put them to death. I consented to it. It wasn't just Stephen that he stood beside as they stoned him to death. It was many Christians that he watched die. And he was happy about it. I punished them, he said. He said, I chased them into the synagogues and punished them. I even tried to get them to blaspheme the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, think about what kind of man this was. He was a wicked, wicked man, a wicked human being. He hated Christ, and he hated Christians. And all he wanted to do was kill them. He said, I even went as far as to uh, chase them down. I pursued them into foreign cities to bring them back, to kill them, to put them into prison. What a man he was. Saul was quite simply an extremely angry person. The devil was using him. Have you ever met anyone like that? That you know the devil's behind everything they do. Saul was one of them that the devil was using him. Saul knew in his heart of hearts that there were more, though, to Christianity than he wanted to admit. I believe as he stood there and, and, and he watched Stephen, it, it convinced him that, that, that there's something more to this because he had never seen a man die like Stephen died. Stephen looked up into the heavens and his face shone round about in the light from heaven. 
And he gave his life for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never had Saul seen anything like this. It convicted him of what he was doing. That's the reason tonight it's so important for you and I to be that testimony to a world that is lost. They need to see someone that loves Jesus so that their heart is convicted within them. I believe Paul was convicted. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Well, it weighed heavy on his heart, we know. He stated this a little later, if you'll look with me. Stay with me now in Acts chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. He said, and I said, Lord, they know that I am prisoned and beat, every, uh, beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. He's, he's confessing to the Lord what he did. How many of you know God already knew? God knows who you are and what you're doing. God knows who I am and what I'm doing. And when the blood of thy martyr, Stephen, see, he mentions it. He's convicted about this, and when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. That's tough. Because running from God tonight will always affect your conscience. You may look like you're doing okay. You may act like you're doing okay. You may even tell people you're doing okay, but when you lay in your bed at night, you know that your conscience will bother you. And you know what God can do. His conscience was bothering him. By the way, folks, our conscience is a red warning light. It's a warning light in our spiritual dashboard. It tells us that something is wrong in our heart and in our lives. It's a flashing light. It's a protective uh, mechanism that tells us that we need to take corrective action right now. Some people did that this morning. Some more need to do that tonight. Corrective action in your Christian life. Because that's what it does. That's what it's for. God is serious when He convicts us. God's not playing around when He brings conviction on our soul. God is trying to tell us something and warn us of something. Tragedy ahead. It's a flashing yellow light. Don't cross without looking and without taking a look at your life. That's what God is doing and that's what God did to Saul. There's always two negative responses to a bad conscience. And they're always common. The first one is this, we pass the buck. A lot of you tonight may be doing this. If you feel like you have tried to do right but still feel guilty, what you do is blame it on somebody else. This is the society that we live in tonight, the blame game. Oh, I blame it on a bad marriage. I, I, I can't get right with the Lord and live right with the Lord because somebody did me wrong. I can't do what I need to do because my daddy was mean to me when I was little. I can't be what I need to be because I was made fun of as a child, so I became a ser serial killer. I, I've heard it all. I've seen it all, and that's a true statement. We play the blame game when our conscience bothers us. The second common response to a bad conscience is to prove a point by giving even, even further into the sin that you were in before. In other words, we, we delve into that sin more than we would usually do because our conscience is bothering us. So we, we're just going to show God. There's a lot of people in this world just want to show God. Well, you keep on doing that, and He'll show you. And that's a common response. I'm just going to go further into this sin. In other words, the drug addict feels, feels guilty about abusing drugs, but doesn't want to admit they are wrong. So what they do, they just start abusing the drugs even more. To prove a point that this don't really bother them. 
But I'm here to tell you tonight, I believe by the Scripture what Paul said about his life, that 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 conviction was there all the time. What he had done to poor old Christians. How he had stoned them and killed them and chased them down and made their families miserable and thrown them into prison. And his conviction was there all the time. Our God is a convicting God. He loves you enough to convict you about your sin. But instead of repenting, most people, uh, they, will, they will go into uh, you know, this, this shell. I'm going to hold out. I'm going to hold out. Lord, you're not going to get me now. Preacher, you tried this morning to preach and get me. Lord, I'm just not going to give in right now. That's the way people do that are under this conviction because of sin in their lives. You're not going to get me, God. But I'm going to tell you something. God is going to get you too. That was Saul. He was under this conviction. Getting it right about Jesus solves the peace problem in your heart and the peace problem in your life. How many want peace tonight? Say amen. I'm so glad tonight that I have peace. I'd rather have peace than a billion dollars, wouldn't you? I'm so glad tonight I have peace in my heart. I'm so glad tonight that I know, that I know, that I know, that I know Jesus. There is no comfort like a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings peace. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verses 17 through 19, about this, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, uh, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forwith and arose and was baptized and and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then Saul, certain days, went with the disciples which were at Damascus. The problem with all of these strategies that we use for conviction and coping with a bad conscience is that we only make the problem worse when we don't give in to God. God will hunt you down. How many understand that tonight? God will hunt you down. He will. You can blame others for your sins, but you still carry the guilt. You can do even more sin to prove that point, that it doesn't bother you, but you still carry the guilt. And usually more and more and more of it. That's what happens. Avoiding guilt never clears a guilty conscience, only Facing it does. Facing your sin tonight. Facing that guilt will only heal you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Once a year, the town drunk made a pilgrimage to the church. He went there to settle a score with his Creator, stumbling down the aisle, praying, Lord, clean out the cobwebs. Lord, Clean out the cobwebs. There was an old lady in that church that was a prayer warrior, and she got tired of hearing him every year doing that. So she interrupted a trip to the altar by standing up and praying, Lord, forget the cobwebs, kill the spider. <laughs> That's a true statement, too. Some of you just need to kill the spider. The cobwebs are only the thing that you're using to try to help your Guilty conscience, what you need to do is kill that thing that's causing that problem in your life. That's why God sent Saul to Ananias. Ananias epitomized the scores of believers there, and he was already, Ananias had already been persecuted by Saul's hand. Ananias knew what kind of man Saul was. He ran from him. Because Saul wanted to kill him. He knew that. They were afraid of Saul. 
They were afraid to be around him. They were afraid for him to come to them. They didn't want to be any, even in the vicinity uh, of Saul. He, he was a persecutor of Christians, but he got saved. God knew that. But Ananias and them didn't. But God did. He knew what his heart was. So he put the two together. Why, the reason I believe he did this was to kill the spider. He wanted to humble himself before the one who had set out to kill him and, and admit that Saul was wrong. Saul wanted to uh, understand the wrongness of what he thought was right. And I believe that Ananias was the top of Saul's fugitive list. By the way, by Ananias, forgiving, uh, by Ananias' forgiveness, could it be that Saul understood the grace of God? You see, Jesus is always teaching us. He's always bringing us a step up, a step closer to where he wants us to be. And some of you tonight are in a state of, of just being where you've been for years. God never stops growing you. I don't care if you're 80 or 90 years old. God will never stop growing you. God wants to grow you tonight in your Christian life. He wants you to step up from where you are now. I heard a story about a church in Cincinnati. True story, by the way. And one of the uh, men was there and he went on the mission field. And he came back to church after his mission field. I think he'd been gone like five or six years. He came back to the church and they wanted him to preach that Sunday morning. He stood in the crowd of about five or six hundred and he told this story. He said, I come back and I expect great things. And all I find is the same old thing. And I'm here to tell you tonight... When God looks at your life, does He find the same old thing? Because God wants us to step up. You're never too old. As long as you live here on this earth, He will always challenge you. Some of us just need to step up and kill the spider tonight. Clear our conscience of what is bothering us. Receive forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what God was teaching Paul. That there was a man named Ananias, even though he had been uh, uh, tracked down by Saul and hated by Saul and persecuted by Saul, that there was a man that was a Christian that could show Christian forgiveness. Some of you need to show some Christian forgiveness tonight maybe. Maybe you need to humble yourself down before someone that you've hurt. And you need to tell them that you're sorry. That's exactly what happened to Mike Singletary. Most of you may not know him, but he was a nine-time all-pro middle linebacker of the Chicago Bears. Most people don't know that after winning the 1986 Super Bowl, this man, whose nickname was Samurai, was at the lowest point in his life. He was one of the meanest men in pro football. He played middle linebacker for the Chicago Bears. At the height of his career, he was uh, so miserable because he had a guilty conscience, and he's told this story. For years and years, he was a vocal uh, Christian. Mike Single, Terry harbored the secret, though, that during uh, his engagement to his soon-to-be wife, he had been unfaithful to her. Out on the road. As bad as that was, and the guilt was nearly eating him alive, is what he said from his own mouth. He knew that he wasn't the wor that wasn't the worst of it. He had, uh, through a facade, betrayed his God in his own words. He says here, I was trapped within myself. I had pride, and I thought that I, was, had, I, was, uh, I had strength, but it was actually weakness because I became totally defeated within myself. I did not trust and I did not even believe in myself at all. And I did not see why anyone else would believe in me either when I was by myself 
and alone, I was afraid of what God was going to do. Something had to be done. His life was such a guilt trip and he was, his conscience was bothering him so much that Mike Singletary did it. He came clean. He didn't pass the buck or prove a point. Rather, he confessed his sin to his wife and uh, to his God that he was an unfaithful imposter. He said his wife just about lost her mind. She cried for months and months. And for Singletary, the pain was unlike anything he had ever known before because he was right with God now. And yet, as he experienced both grief and forgiveness, he knew that God was doing a work in his life. He was becoming empty of himself. His pride was dissolving in the ocean of God's grace. Here's what Mike Singletary learned out of all of this. He said, I think the thing that I learned the most is that God can be trusted. I've realized that every day is a new day, a blessing from God. We have to realize that no matter who we are, we are weak. No matter how hard we try, we control nothing. No matter how hard I try to secure my future, I could wake up in the next day, have a lump in my chest, be in the hospital, and die that same day. He said, when we finally realize how weak we are, then we realize how strong God is. And I'm here to tell you tonight, why don't you let God show you how strong He is in your life? Give up that thing that is bothering your conscience tonight. Give up that thing that is making you guilty every day of your life. Come to an old-fashioned altar and tell God you're sorry. And I'm here to tell you tonight, when you tell Him you're sorry and you get forgiveness of that, He will take you to heights that you've never been before. It's a good message for all of us. It's not just Saul's message and Paul's message. It's our message tonight. Being right is not enough, folks. It's not enough when you're wrong about Jesus Christ. It's not enough when your conscience is convicting you. Being right is not enough when you are right about all the wrong things. Being right without being redeemed. Being saved. Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Being right without Him. I'm here to tell you, it's surely not enough. I'm so glad tonight that I am right. Not because I'm proud, not because I know everything, but I'm right because I have a relationship with Jesus. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the message tonight. Thank you for being so wonderful to us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that we feel here. And Lord, it's just time to make it right. It's time to kill the spider. It's time, Father, to quit just cleaning out the cobwebs once in a while. But God, getting rid of that thing that is keeping us from being all that you would have us to be. Lord, tonight, this ought to be one of those messages that stirs up revival in our lives. That we don't have to be like this. But Lord, we can be so much more. And the reason we can be so much more is because we're children of the King. We're ambassadors. We're all that you've given us in this life all we have to do is grab it Lord we love you and we thank you for the story and the trueness of this conversion experience of one named Saul to Paul and we could preach all night on the rest of his life all the writings that you gave him, all the missionary journeys that you gave to him, all the millions and millions of people that were saved under his ministry. 
Now, Lord, use us. Help us, Father, to humble ourselves before you tonight. If you're here tonight and God is speaking to you, and you know He's speaking to you, you hear His voice, that still, small voice, you don't have to tell me anything. This is between you and God tonight. But you know God is speaking to you on coming to this altar, whatever it's for. I'm going to ask you right now, we're going to dismiss right now, but I'm going to ask you right now to step out from where you are and come to this altar tonight. We're just going to take a minute. Would you come? Would you come tonight?